All right, everyone. If you watched part one of this series, welcome back. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you watch that first and then come back to this. But even if you haven't seen that one, again, this is starting a new problem following this procedure here. Uh, and you can follow along uh, these two examples. Basically, in part one, I went over this example here. So in part two here, the second video, I'm going to go over both of these, G of X and H of X. And H of X is kind of tricky. It's not long, though. It's not going to take as much work. It just has an issue. It has a common factor. And we're going to have to show you how to handle that case. This one, as you'll see, has its own tricks. But again, it just gives you a variety of problems. OK, so let's get cracking here. Let's see what's the first thing we need to do. Factor. Can we factor anything up top? Not really. So that's just x cubed. How about the bottom? Difference of squares. x minus 3, x plus 3. Step 1 done. Not yet. We need the domain. What's the domain of this function? What does this function accept? And what does this function hate? Well, this function does not like 3 and negative 3. Because if you plug in 3 or negative 3, it makes the bottom 0. And we can't divide by 0 if you have a fraction. So, fancy way of saying stay away from negative 3 and 3 is to write it using interval notations this way. It's a pretty long way of writing it, but it basically means stay away from 3 and negative 3. Any other x will do. Okay, that's step 1. Step 2, find all asymptotes. So, do we have a vertical asymptote? Yes, of course. It's whatever makes the bottom 0. Again, and make sure you don't have a common factor. So x equals 3 and x equals negative 3 again will play the role also of a vertical asymptote. So there's two vertical asymptotes. x equals negative 3, x equals 3. Good. And again, remember, that's how we give the answer. How about a horizontal? What do you guys think? I wish you could tell me and I could hear you. Probably shouting at your screen right now. Unfortunately, I cannot hear you. But I think I heard you. You said no. Somebody said no. Maybe it's a voice in my head. Well, the answer is right. The answer is no. <laughs> there is no horizontal asymptote. Why? Well, because the degree of the top, if you look at the powers of x there, the degree of the top is 3, degree of the bottom is 2. That's recipe for no horizontal asymptote, right? Bad news for the horizontal asymptote. So none. Okay, and we got to write it in red. Didn't mean to, but that's okay. We'll leave it there. How about uh, slant asymptote? Okay, the, my slant asymptote detector says you only get a slant asymptote if the degree of the top is exactly one higher than the degree of the bottom. And that's exactly the case here. The degree of the top is 3. That's one more than 2. So that means we do have a slant asymptote. So the answer is yes. But that's, that's not enough. If I have a slant asymptote, it's going to have an equation. I need to come up with the equation for that. Now remember what slant, by the way, they also use another word that comes from French. Sounds really cool. Instead of the word slant, sometimes they use the word oblique. Okay, so you can impress your friends by using the word oblique. Usually people say, well, you know, that's oblique. No, I don't know. I don't think I ever used oblique in a conversation, but oblique basically is a French word that means slant. Okay, so oh, the slant asymptote exists, but What's the formula for it? And what, what do we mean, first of all, by slant asymptote? Well, slant asymptote, remember, just a quick sketch that I'm going to erase in a second here. Remember, we said the horizontal asymptote is basically some kind of horizontal line that the graph maybe follows like that or follows like that, let's say. That's an example of a horizontal asymptote. A vertical asymptote is a vertical line that the graph maybe follows up here or follows on this side or follows down here, right? 
What's a slant? Well, slant is basically a slanted line. <laughs> so it's not vertical, it's not horizontal. So it could be like this. And the graph is still going to try to follow it along. So long term, the graph might follow it this way. And long term here, maybe the graph follows it this way. All right. So that's an example of a picture involving a slant asymptote. So the interesting thing about this is that when you have a slant asymptote, it's typically going to be a tilted line like that. It could be tilted that way or it could be tilted this way, right? So the formula is not going to be just y equal to a number or x equal to a number because y equal to a number is reserved for a horizontal line. x equal to a number is reserved for a vertical line. So if you have a slant, it's going to be of the form y equals mx plus b. So the big question mark is how do I get the mx plus b? How do I know what the y is equal to for my slant asymptote? And the answer to that question is division. So we need to divide. We need to divide and conquer here. Now let's make this bigger. Look, this is going to erase all of this mess. Isn't that cool? This is better than actual paper. All right. So how do I get this? So you basically take the x cubed and you divide. Now, can we do synthetic division when we divide this by that? Uh, can't do that. Why? Remember this, this could show up in your exam. Synthetic division can only be used if you're dividing by a linear polynomial. If you divide them by something that's degree one here. So if this was x to the one or x. So bad news, we cannot use synthetic division. We have to use long division because we're dividing by a quadratic here. So we've got x cubed and I'm dividing by x squared minus 9. Okay, here we are. Your favorite technique of all algebra. Probably the most hated technique ever <laughs> is uh, long division. So remember how it works. I look at this x squared and I look at this x cubed and I ask the question. What should I times this by to get that? Well, I need an x. Let's put it there. Some people like to put, it, put things in a certain way here. It doesn't matter. It's purely aesthetic. So x times this will be x cubed. I'm going to put it underneath. x times 9, be careful, minus 9, is going to be minus 9x. I don't have anything to line it up with, but so we'll just put it there. But here comes the key step. You're supposed to subtract. So how do you do this? You can do it mentally as long as you remember to switch the signs in your head and you don't make mistakes. Or you can do what I like to do, which is... When you subtract in this, whatever you're subtracting, switch the signs right away. So make that a minus, make that a plus. And then add vertically. Because basically subtraction is like the addition of the opposite. Okay, let's think about that again. Subtracting something is like adding the opposite of something. If you take in some number minus 5, like 7 minus 5... Let me write it here. 7 minus 5 can be thought of as 7 plus negative 5. Right, so if you're trying to subtract 5, it's like adding the opposite of 5. All right, I digress. I need to stop going into all these tangents. So there's so much to talk about. Isn't that math? Math, you start talking about something, it leads to something else. Ooh, you don't want to do that. Cool. We got the undo. We can undo things. That cool, you can undo. Can you imagine in real life if you could undo things? All right, so this right here, when you add, those are going to cancel. And think of this as like a zero there. If you add it to 9x, you're going to get 9x. Okay, are we done? Are we there yet? Well, if this is has a degree less than the degree of the polynomial you're dividing by, then the division process is, is over. Which is the case. This is degree 1. This is degree 2. So we're done. Okay. We don't care about the remainder. This is the remainder. And this is the quotient. When you're doing this in this context, which is finding the slant asymptote, then you just care about the quotient. The quotient is the mx plus b part, basically. So this is the part that you're going to set equal to y. That's what goes in there. And this is my formula for my slant asymptote. So this graph has a slant asymptote at the line y equals x, which is, by the way, the diagonal between 
quadrant one and quadrant three. Okay, good news. Done with the asymptotes. That took a while. How about the intercepts? So start with the x-intercepts. I'm going to put s in parentheses here because it could be one, could be more, could be none. Remember what we said earlier, and we said in a previous video, if you've seen that already, to find the x-intercepts, and it's actually written here, you have to find what makes the numerator zero. Is that a number you could plug in for x to make the top zero? Yes, zero is the only number, right? You could plug in zero, it makes the top zero. And if it makes the top zero, it makes the whole fraction zero. And if it makes the whole fraction zero, then it must have a y value equals zero. So zero, zero. So the x-intercept is gonna be zero comma zero. Now that's strange because that's the origin. So what we're saying here, we're saying the graph passes through the origin. Now there's something cool about that. When the graph passes through the origin, it's crossing both the x-axis and the y-axis. So this point here, the origin, is going to turn out to play a dual role. It's a, both an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So this is going to be an x-intercept for now. And then when we get to the step where we're asking what's the y-intercept, remember how we do it? We, we plug in 0. So we do g of 0, since they call it g instead of f here. g of 0 which again will be 0 over 0 minus 9, which will be 0 over negative 9, which will be 0. So that tells you again that 0, 0 is the answer. So it's the same point. I'm not going to label it differently. It's exactly the same point. So, so this is playing both roles. It's at the same time an x-intercept and a y-intercept. And again, it makes sense because that's, it sits right at the intersection of the two axes. So if the graph goes through it, it's going through both of these axes at the same time. All right, let's take a breather. Whew. Okay, let's continue. Now we need to start graphing. So this is again where we already completed steps one through three, and we need to plot what we've got and then try to pick additional points. All right, so let's see. Let's plot the slant asymptotes, and this time I'm going to actually use a different color. So, how do we graph y equals x? Let me write it on this side here. y equals x. How do we graph it? Or if this was like a y equals 2x minus 3, how would you graph it? Well, to graph a line, you need a couple points. So, you could make a little table, or without even writing a table, you just plug two numbers for x. So, I already obviously know it goes through 0, 0. Right? If you plug in 0, you get 0. What's another number you could plug in for x? I could plug in 1. If you plug in 1, you get 1. There you have it, two points. You didn't have to pick exactly the same two points I pick, but as long as you pick two points that make this equation true, you're okay. You're good. It's going to give you exactly the same line. So, 0, 0, 1, 1 is right there. And now I get to use the ruler and draw this line. Now notice this line is not vertical, it's not horizontal. All right, I hope you don't mess this up here. Trying to use a ruler on an iPad with the actual, let's see here. Let's cheat and use the, the line straightener there. Isn't that cool? Look at that line, it's perfect. I did that freehand. No, I lied. I did not do that freehand. Okay, so this is y equals x. Isn't that cool? We got ourselves a slant asymptote. So remember what this means. This means that long term, like as x gets bigger, as the x values get bigger, and the x values get really small, like go toward negative infinity, this graph, the graph that we're trying to come up with, this mysterious graph is gonna hug this line. Is going to follow this line along. But horizontal asymptotes and slant asymptotes are end behavior asymptotes. So they only kick in toward large values of x in a positive or negative direction. So the, the hugging part doesn't happen until the far right and the far left. So in the middle, the graph may actually do all kind of stuff and be away, far away from this line. But 
As x gets bigger, the farther you go to the right, the graph starts to get tighter and closer to this. And same with the far left. And again, we're going to confirm this by plotting points and going from there. What else did we find? Did you find anything else? Yeah, we found two, two uh, vertical asymptotes, remember? y e x equals 3 and x equals negative 3. Remember, we didn't get a horizontal asymptote. So there's that one. And there's this one. All right, let's label them. So this is, let's see here, let's get rid of that. x equals negative 3, x equals 3. Good. We've got all the asymptotes graphed. What else did we have? We had a x-intercept, y-intercept. There's only one, 0 0.00. We labeled it point A. That's all we've got. So we plotted all the information we've got. Okay. This is now where I need more points. Now, where do I need more points? Pretty much everywhere, because we only have one point. And then remember the rule that I said earlier? Kind of nice rule to remember. It's a good idea to have three points either side of a vertical asymptote. Since I have two vertical asymptotes, it's a good idea to have maybe at least three points in the middle there, three points on this side, three points on this side. Also, don't forget this. We need to check whether the graph crosses or touches its horizontal or slant asymptote. We don't have a horizontal here, but we do have a slant. So we need to check, is, it, is my graph going to cross the slant asymptote? And again, we're going to make sure we do that check before we finalize our graph. Let's take care of the points first. So how do I get uh, more points? Well, I'm going to make a little table. So let's do that up here. Nope, not like that. Let's use a straight line. X and then G of X. So what number should I pick? Well, let's try some numbers either side here. So maybe I'll use like 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. Oh, did you guys notice anything? Well, there's something cool about this function. It's a topic we discussed way back in this course when we talked about even an odd functions. Remember we said, if you ever detect that you have an odd function, the graph of it is symmetric across the origin. Because basically when you plug in opposite x values, you're going to get opposite y values. This formula here is an odd function. Because if you plug in negative x, the negative up top will stay. And the negative in the bottom will disappear because the square cancels it out. And then you can bring the negative up front and you get the opposite of the original formula. So the graph that we're going to end up with here, hint, 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 is symmetric across the origin, which means whatever happens here is going to get flipped over the origin, and it's going to show up here. Okay, we'll pretend we don't know that. So, but you'll notice that. That's one way you can kind of, it helps you kind of cut down the amount of work. But if you don't want to worry about that, we can just pick positive and negative numbers. So let's pick positive 1, positive 2, negative 1, negative 2. We need stuff either side of this. So on this side here, maybe like 4 or 5, and negative 4, negative 5. Now the formula for this function, which is written down here, the formula of that function is not too bad, right? We could use the factored form. I'm going to write it up here x cubed over x minus 3 and x plus 3. So I'm going to use that to quickly figure out what these numbers are. If you plug in 1, you're going to get 1 up top, you're going to get negative 2 here, and you're going to get uh, 4. Negative 2 times 4 is negative 8, so you get negative 1 over 8. You could actually use the non-factored form. It's not too bad to plug that in there either. If you plug in 2, this gives you 8 up top, this gives you negative 1 times 5, 
So 8 fifth or negative 8 fifth. If you plug in uh, negative one, you're gonna get negative one on top and you're still gonna get negative eight on the bottom. So you get guess, guess what you get. Well, that shouldn't surprise us after what I mentioned earlier. Notice it gave me the answer that's the opposite what, of what one gave me. Again, that's not surprising when you have an odd function. So can you guess what negative two is gonna give you? It's gonna give me eight fifth. If you don't believe me, plug it in. All right, how about four? If you put four in there, be careful, the top gives you 64. The bottom is gonna give you one times seven. So that's a seven, so 64 sevens. Okay, what's 64 sevens? Well, that's 63 sevens, which is nine, and one over seven. So this is nine and one seventh. Okay, how about five? If you plug in five in there, you're gonna get 125 on top, and you're gonna get uh, five minus three, which is two, five plus three, which is eight, two times eight, 16. Okay, that's not pretty, right? So 16 times nine, what's 16 times nine? 144, so 16 times eight. That's 80 plus 48, 80 plus 48, 128, that's not, there yet. How about 16 times 7? 16 times 7 gives you 42 plus 70, so 112. Yeah, so this is 7 and let's say 12, 13 sixteenths. Okay, now again, if you want to use a calculator, you can, of course. I'm an assistant on not using the calculator because I like it better that way. So this right here gives you the four and the five. And again, now <laughs> the cat is out of the bag. We already know this is an odd function. So what do you think these will give us? Well, they're gonna give us the opposites of these. So it's gonna be negative nine one seventh and negative seven and 13 sixteenths. All right, let's erase all this garbage here. We don't need all this mess here. Clutter not a beautiful graph. Now let's label them. I'm gonna call these point B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So one negative one eighth, really tiny right there. And that's point B. Two negative eight fifth. By the way, negative eight fifth, you can think of that as negative one and three fifths. Okay, so negative one and three fifths. That's roughly there, that's point C. Then, uh, where are we? Point D, negative one up by one eighth. That's roughly there, that's point D. How about negative two? It's gonna be up by one and three fifths, so roughly there, that's point E. How about four? Well, four gives me nine and one seventh. Well, that's four is here. I'm gonna go up by three, up by another three, up by another three, that's nine, and one seventh, which is kind of tiny. So that's roughly there. So that's uh, point F. Then point G is five, is gonna take me up to seven and 13 16. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And 13 16 is really close to eight. So that's gonna be on the higher end here. That's point G. Good, making progress. Now let's do the other two at the end there. So negative four, which is down here, is gonna go down by, uh, what did we say, nine? So three, 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 and one seventh, roughly there. That was point H. And then negative five, which is, you just scoot over to the left of that. So this is negative four, this is four, this is five, this is two, this is one. All right, 
let's make that one right there. So this is, uh, what did we say? This was negative seven and 316. So this is negative three, negative three, negative one, and three, 13 sixteenths, and I ran there. So that's point I. Okay, we're almost there. Now that's a soup of points, it's a mess. But before we actually start drawing or guessing what the graph is doing, we need to actually uh, check if the graph possibly intersects its horizontal, its uh, slant asymptote, like the graph I'm gonna come up with. Does it ever touch, cross this line? Remember, that's possible. In fact, if it's gonna happen, it might happen somewhere in the middle here because it looks like there's some crisscross in here. The graph is probably gonna follow the vertical asymptote here and go through these points. Remember, this point A, even though I have it in red there, that's also part of the graph. That's, that's, the, that's the X intercept and the Y intercept. So the graph might do something like this and cross right there and then flips over and comes back down here. But does it cross anywhere else? I don't know. So I need to check for that. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, to just to make myself some room, I'm going to get rid of these points here to use this corner here to, do, to check the intersection. So let's delete all this stuff there. Yay, it's cool to delete everything. It's clean. Okay, now let's see. Uh, remember what the actual function was. The function was g of x equals x cubed over x squared minus 9. Remember what the formula was for the, the slant asymptote. It was y equals x. If you want to find whether these two formulas are going to cross or intersect, you take the two y values and you set them equal. So you take whatever the y value equals here and whatever the y value equals here, because remember, this this is code for y value, and you set them equal to each other. So you take x cubed over x squared minus 9, set it equal to x, and now you got to solve this. Think of this as like x over 1. All right, that doesn't look pretty, but we can, we can handle this, OK? So, Let's, Chris, uh, let's uh, cross multiply. So if you take this times that and this times that, this gives you x cubed equals x times x squared minus 9. All right. Let's actually distribute. So this gives you x cubed equals x cubed minus 9x. This actually causes something nice to happen. If I subtract x cubed, it goes away. So this cancels. So I'm left with 0 equals negative 9x. Solve for x. If you divide by negative 9, divide by negative 9, you get x equals 0. So this means, yes, the graph of my function and the graph of the slant asymptote will cross. It They will cross precisely or intersect, technically. We don't know if they cross or not. But they will intersect at this location when x is 0. Now, we're not surprised because that's what, based on the points we picked up, we expected that probably is a possibility. Now, what makes you know that it does cross, like not only it touches, but it goes through the line, it's the points that you have either side of that. So the points on this side are below, the points on this side are above the line, so I know that not only this graph is coming down and touching the red line, it's also going to go through it and come back underneath. So now I've got all the information I needed to finalize my graph. So let's do it. So this is what the graph is going to do here. And here it's going to flip over and follow the horizontal asymptote right there. Beautiful. Now, what is it, what is it going to do down here or up here? Well, it's going to have, to, because remember, this is getting farther to the right. So what did we say? The farther you go to the right, the graph is going to do. It's going to follow the slant asymptote, because that's an end behavior asymptote. So it's going to hug, it's going to have to hug this line right here. So we can imagine that that's probably what it's doing. There's a curve going through these two points, and it's going to turn around and follow this and hug it. 
But because we also have a vertical asymptote and it cannot go through that, it's probably going to follow this one upward like this. So. Here's a nice sketch of this. Now, because of symmetry with respect to the origin, this is going to flip over and show up down here also. Something similar to that. So it's going to do something similar to that down here. Oops. There you have it. Awesome. We got ourselves a complete picture. That's the graph. All right, so it does cross. See, it's okay for it to cross, to touch, and even cross through its slant asymptote. But notice it didn't do it necessarily toward the extreme. It did it right in the middle, right, which is okay because it's an end behavior asymptote. All right, so that's that's the graph of this. Now, the only other thing I want to mention, and I didn't do this in a previous uh, example, but I'll mention it here, is this optional sign chart way of checking the graph. Okay, so the only thing the sign chart helps you do is basically check which parts of the graph showed up above the x-axis and which parts of the graph showed up below the x-axis. So first, let's actually look at our graph and see if we can even decide what that means or what that is for our graph. So notice in our graph, in this region here, the graph showed up up here. So it's above this blue line here, above the x-axis. So the y is positive there. On this side here, in between 0 and the asymptote, which is 3, the graph showed up below the x-axis. On this side, in between negative 3 and um, 0, the graph is above. So the y values here are positive, the y values here are negative, the y values here are positive, and the y values here are entirely below the x-axis, so they're all negative. So I can actually use the formula to do this. And then I can check if my graph matches what I expected. That's what this sign chart works. So how do you come up with this sign chart? Well, to do it, you have to make uh, take the number line and you have to include the zeros of the numerator and the zeros of the denominator. So let me, again, make some room for this. So let's erase all this here. So here is my formula. Remember my formula was f of, oh, oops, try that again. It's g, it's not f. g of x equals x cubed over x minus 3 and x plus 3. So remember the zeros of the numerator. Zeros of top. The only thing that made the top zero is zero. Zeros of bottom, negative 3 and 3. Now, those come in with an asterisk because those are where the asymptote shows up. So what we were going to do is take, draw a number line and place these numbers on it. And the numbers that make the bottom 0, I need to do something to highlight those because those are weird, right? Because those are not accepted. So I'm going to put negative 3. I'm going to put 0. I'm going to put 3. But 3 and negative 3, I'm going to double line them. Put like a line and right next to it another line like that. Why am I doing that? Because those make the bottom 0. So those are where the vertical asymptotes will show up. What is this zero? Well, that's where the x-intercept showed up. So this is exactly where the x-intercept showed up. These two markers here are for the numbers where the vertical asymptotes showed up. So basically, you place on your line your vertical asymptote locations and your x-intercept locations, which again goes back to what makes the top zero and what makes the bottom zero, which is kind of cool. Now, 
This is sometimes referred to as the sign chart technique. That's how I like to call it. Uh, and, and most people like to call it that. But some books, like your book, and uh, if you go on, on uh, my, my Lab Math or My Lab, my math lab or whatever you, they call it these days, they probably would refer to it by another name. They would call it the, uh, what do they call it? They call it the test point technique. Well, you'll see why they like to call it that, but you'll also see why we call it the sign chart technique. So keep in mind when, if you're doing on an online homework and it says use the test point technique, it's the same thing. It's a sign chart technique. So why do they call it the test point technique? Because I want to know what the Y value is in each one of these intervals. How am I going to know that? Well, you pick a test point. So you pick a number that belongs to that interval. So for example, I could pick negative four as a test point there in that region. I could use negative one as a test point in that region. I could use one as a test point in that region. I could use four as a test point in that region. Now, here's the good news. We can cheat. We can get this information from our table or even from my picture. What you do is now you plug these into the formula, plug them in here. And here's what you're worried about. You don't care so much about the answer. You care more about the sign of the answer. That's what you're concerned with. So who cares what the number is? We just want to know, is it positive or negative? Because positive means above the x-axis, negative means below the x-axis. That's all we care about, right? All we care about is the sign, hence sign chart technique. I like that thing better. All right, so let's see. So how can I do this on the fly very quickly without wasting too much time? Let's, dry, let's try negative 4. If I put negative 4 and cube it, do I get negative or positive? Negative. Let's make it. Put it here. Then put negative 4 minus 3. That gives me negative. Negative 4 plus 3 also gives me negative. Now, what's the sign of this going to turn out to be? Well, I've got a negative on top divided by a negative times negative. So that gives you negative over positive. Negative over positive gives you negative. So what does that mean? That means if you are in this region, the graph is going to have negative y values. So the graph will be below the x-axis. So I'm going to put a negative there. Okay, do you guys see how this works? Pause the video and try to do uh, do try to do these three, and then resume to see if I yeah, I got the same thing you got. All right, so if you tried this, let's try negative one. Negative one cubed will give me negative. Negative one minus three will give me negative. Negative one plus three will give me positive. The ratio of this will end up being positive. By the way, here's a quick way to tell when you have a bunch of these like negative signs, how, how can you quickly tell what the answer is going to be? If you count an odd number of negatives, you're going to end up with a negative. If there's an even number of negatives, it's going to end up being positive. So we have an even number of negatives. There's two negatives there. Here we had three odd. It's, it's an odd number of negatives, three negatives. So you get negative. All right, so this is going to be above in this region. Okay, and I put the plus above just to kind of highlight that it's above. Plug in one. If you plug in one, one cubed gives you positive. One minus three gives you negative. One plus three gives you positive. This gives you negative because there's an odd number of negatives. So here it's going to be negative. Plug in four. Positive over positive over positive. That gives you positive. Do you guys see how this works? That's the sign chart technique. There you have it. Let's erase all this mess. And then let's see what was the point of doing all this. What was the point of doing this uh, test point technique or sign chart technique? Well, it's predicting that my graph to the left of negative three, so to, le to the left of my vertical asymptote at negative 3, the graph should be below the x-axis. Yes, true. Look, my graph is below. 
in between negative 3 and 0, it's telling me the graph is expected to be above the x-axis. Look, this graph, this branch of the graph is above the x-axis. Good. In between 0 and 3, it's telling me the graph is below the x-axis. So look, in between 0 and 3, when x is somewhere in there, the y values on the graph are below the x-axis. Between 3 and infinity, it's telling me the graph is going to be back above the x-axis. So look, the graph is up here. It's above the x-axis. There it is. Did you really need this to graph it? No, that's why I like to make it optional. Right, so this sign chart is just a nice way to kind of check parts of the, it doesn't check everything for you, obviously. It just tells you whether roughly you got it right, like if things above and below. But is it really essential? Do you have to do this? Like, could we have lived without doing this step? Absolutely. What we did earlier and we got the graph was all the stuff we needed to get a good picture. So this is really just an optional way to check your answer. So there you have it. That's, that's the sign chart technique or the test point technique. All right, let's wrap up with the last example. I know you're probably exhausted. So again, feel free to pause this video and come back to it some other time. Uh, I might actually have to split this to three videos. Well, by the time you watch it, you probably know if I did or not. All right, so now we're going to move on to the third and final example. So the third and final example is this h of x, which equals to this. Now, there's a major issue with this one. When you start with step one, and you start to factor, let's start with the bottom part. The bottom part can fact get factored into x plus 2 and x plus 3. The top part... I can pull out an x. Ooh, I made a mistake. That's annoying. This should be a square. That should be a square. So this should be a square right there. That should be a square. I'm going to actually fix it because you know me. It will bug me. So I'm going to double check this. I'm going to make that. I'm going to see how quick I can do this. So this would be that. Close your eyes, open them. Isn't that cool? I just fix it. Good. So h of x is x cubed plus 3x squared plus, uh, yeah, x squared. Is that what I wanted to do? Let me think. I'm trying to think here. Mm, I'm going to change it. I don't like that either. I'm going to make it. Oops. Bear with me here a second. It will only take a second to fix this. It's not bad at all. I'm going to make it x squared and 3x. So we didn't need to actually make that change that one, but we do need to change this one. Here we go. Now we're good. Now we'll come back here. I'm going to fix this one. This is an easy fix. You good? Gone. Two. There you have it. Fixed. Matches. Good. Good news. Yeah. Let's make this in read mode. Good. Looks prettier. There you have it. So that's the function h of x. Now, let's go ahead and factor this. So how do we factor this top? Well, the only thing we can do is pull out an x. So this becomes x times x plus 3. Now you see why I wanted this, right? What do you notice? We do have a common factor common factor right there there you have it common factor you know how they say common factor in french factor commun it sounds very similar all right so we have a common factor or factor commun so this common factor throws a wrench in the whole system because our procedure cannot proceed because we don't uh, we, we can only use this procedure if we have no common factor so what do we do I know what you're thinking 
you're thinking about doing something that's very convenient to do, but it's going to be totally wrong. I know, I can read your mind. I know what you were just thinking. You said, oh, that's not a big deal. Cancel it! Well, I have bad news for you. You cannot cancel it. Because what happens when you cancel it? If you were working with just an algebraic expression outside the context of a uh, function. So if, us, if somebody just, if you were doing a problem in algebra, like beginning algebra, and they gave you something like this, and they said, simplify this rational expression. You don't have to copy this down. This is just a side note. In that scenario, under those circumstances, yeah, you can just cancel this and make it x over x plus 2, and your teacher will give you a pat on the back and say, that's perfect. Good job. And you probably got used to doing that, and you were happy with that. And now what I'm going to tell you is going to be shocking. So what I'm telling you is you can't do that. That's illegal. Why is it illegal? Well, the simple change now is that the context is different. Right? The context now is this formula is not just a, an independent, standalone, rational expression. It's actually a function. And a function has a graph, and for each x value, you have a corresponding y value that gives you a dot on the graph. Now, if you cancel, you actually made a change to that graph. So it can no longer be the same function anymore. So it is absolutely wrong to do this. Let me get rid of this stuff here real quick. So it is wrong to say equals and then x over x plus 2. Because what you're basically saying is the formula of this function here, which is the reduced part, and the formula of the function here, which still has the common factor, are going to have exactly the same graph, which is unfortunately a lie. They're actually going to have very similar graphs, but one location is going to be different. There is one single point where they're not going to be the same. And that kind of ruins it for this whole equal part of things. So I cannot say this is these are equal unless they match for any x value. But there is a one problem. Can you guess what that number is? It's the number that makes the common factor zero. What number would you plug in in that common factor to make it zero? The answer is negative three. If you put negative three in here, what do you get? You get negative three over negative three plus two, which is negative three over negative one, which is three. So this graph or this formula, when x is negative three, is going to give you a dot at three. But Try negative 3 here. If you plug negative 3 here, what happens? You get something that's completely nonsense. You get this weird answer. You get 0 on top over 0 on bottom, which is one of those really strange answers in mathematics. It's so strange that it gets its own designation. It's put in its own special category. Now, you could say, wait a minute. We know what that is. That's undefined. No, actually, this is different. If you have 0 over 5, that's 0. If you have 5 over 0, that's undefined. But if you get this third kind, 0 over 0, that's called indeterminate. It's a weird word, again, inherited from French, because the French did a lot of math. So, form indeterminé. That's indeterminate. That's where indeterminate came from. It's an English word that's basically borrowed from a French word. So this is still undefined in some sense, but not the same kind as this undefined. Now, if you go into calculus or you have to take calculus, you'll learn more about this. But for now, just accept that this is not going to give you a dot on the graph. It's not going to give you a valid point. So there's no way we can say 
that this formula is equal to this formula because there is we found one location where they don't agree even if it's just one point every even if they match at every other point that ruins the equal you cannot use the equal symbol you cannot say these two are equal this equal symbol is sacred you only use it if you know for certain that this quantity is always going to match with this quantity which we cannot say that's true that's we found a number where they don't match so how do we get around this well i'm still going to reduce it but i'm not going to say that it's equal to the reduced part i'm going to have to label the reduced part some other function so here's how we handle it so and this is again the way we're going to handle any problems where you have a common factor so let me get rid of all this stuff here you don't need all that now i'm gonna let and pick a name for a function you know this is h of x we just can't use h so we could use any le other letter we could use f or g so let f of x equals to this without the common factor which would have been x over x plus 2. So here is what we know. The graphs of f and h will match everywhere except at x equals negative 3, which is the 0 zero of the common factor so what happens there well at that location this function will have a dot but this function will have an will have something invalid so it's not going to have a dot what is it going to have then it's not going to have an asymptote there it's actually going to have an open dot. It's going to have like a hollow circle. So graph of f has a dot at x equals negative 3. But graph of h has an open dot at x equals negative 3. So that's the important adjustment. Now, armed with this information, we can sneak our way and figure out a way to graph the function h. Because remember what this procedure said. This procedure, imagine this procedure is like some kind of restricted area you have to get into. And the only way you can get into, if you can show, show a card that says, look, the function on my card has no common factor. But the function we have has a common factor. So how do we get in? We can get in. Well, we can take the reduced version of it, which we just called it f, and take the function f instead. Because if I can show the function f, it doesn't have a common factor, I can get in. But I really needed function h. I need to graph the function h. I don't want to graph the function f. Well, that's actually easy. All I need to do is follow this procedure here to get the picture for f. Once I have the complete picture for the graph of f, there's only one little tweak I need to make, and it becomes the graph, magically the graph of h. What's that tweak? The tweak is to go to where x is equal to negative 3 and change the dot to an open circle. So this is the procedure you use anytime you have a common factor. You factor first. If you see that you have a common factor, reduce it, but be careful. Don't say that's equal to your function. Call it some other function. Otherwise, that's wrong. Follow the procedure for graphing this function, our procedure, our five-step procedure, or your book calls it the six-step procedure. And then go to the location of the zero of the common factor which in this case is negative three and change it to an open dot 
and that will make it the graph of the function with the common vector. So I'm going to say this one more time because I know this can sound really confusing and then we're going to go through it. So factor, if you have a common factor, reduce but call it some other function. Now this function doesn't have a common factor so we can follow the steps to graph it. And then when you're done graphing it, change the dot at the location where x is the zero of the common factor, change it from a dot to an open dot, and it becomes the graph of the function with the common factor. All right, let's go through it. So let's do our procedure for f. So we, for a while, all we're doing is focus on f. Forget this function. We're not even worried about that. So let's do our steps. It doesn't factor any further, so we don't have to factor it any further. What's the domain of f? Well, negative infinity, negative 2, union negative 2 to infinity. Uh, does it have a vertical asymptote? I'm going to abbreviate here, VA. Does it have vertical asymptote? Yes, at x equals negative 2. Does it have a ha? Ha ha. Not ha as in funny, but ha as horizontal asymptote. Does it have a horizontal asymptote? Uh, yes because this is degree one, degree one, they match. So what do you do then? Well, you take the numbers in front of them, which again, even though this is not written, imagine that to be one there. And you take the ratio of those two and you set it equal to y. So this is y equals uno, one. Ah, like the French say. Does it have a slant asymptote? An SA. No, because you can't have a slant unless the degree of the top is one more than the bottom. How about the x-intercepts? So whatever makes the, uh, the top zero. So x-intercept is zero, zero. Because if you plug in zero up top, it makes the whole thing zero. So that's going to be the origin again, which by the way, I guess that's going to also be a horizontal, a uh, y-intercept. So let's call this point A. So y-intercept is also point A. What else? What do we need? Ooh, oh, we got everything. Yeah, we got everything. Okay, now we need to graph what we've got, find additional points, check for intersection with the horizontal, finalize the graph, and then change the dot to an open circle and it becomes the graph of H. Okay, so let's actually plot the stuff I already know. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna write down this information because I'm gonna flip pages. So y equals 1, x equals negative 2, 0, 0. Uh, that's all we need, really. I should have been able to remember those, but, you know, I'm probably losing my mind these days. So let's see. So how about y equals 1? So I'm going to go ahead, again, I'm going to use different color to make this colorful and pretty. So this right here is the horizontal. asymptote. How about x equals negative 2? Well, that one wasn't really perfect, but I'll get over it. So this right here is x equals negative 2. This is the y equals to 1. There we go. We have the ha and the va. So how about the zero zero? Let's call that point A. Now I'm not going to use that color. I'm going to use black for the points. So this is point A. Very good. Okay. Obviously, this is not enough, right? So we need more points. So let's make a table. I'm kind of trying to go through this a little bit faster because by now you probably are comfortable with this process. So this right here is x. This is going to be, again, remember which function we're dealing with here. It's f of x. Okay, so we're dealing with f of x. So what number should I pick? Well, it looks like I'm going to need a lot of numbers, right? And not a lot of points. So maybe pick something here, pick something here, because I need to have enough to the left of the vertical asymptote and enough to the right. So maybe I'll use... Uh, negative 1, 
negative, um, what was it, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, that's enough on that side. Let's try something to the right of 0, so maybe like 1, 2, 3. All right, remember what the function was. The function was x over, what was it, x, x over x plus 2. Okay, so this one is actually not bad at all for us to quickly compute it. If you plug in negative 1 in here, you get negative 1 on top, you get negative 1 plus 2, so that's 1, so you get negative 1. Plug in negative 3, you get negative 3 on top, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1, so negative 3 divided by negative 1 gives you 3. Plug in negative 4, negative 4 over negative 4 plus 2, that's going to give you negative 2, so negative 4 over negative 2 gives you 2. Plug in negative 5, you get negative 5 over negative 3, so that's 5 thirds. Plug in 1, you get 1 third. Plug in 2, you get 2 over 4, which is 1 half. Plug in uh, 3, you get 3 over 5. Okay, let's give them labels. Point B, point C, D, E, F, G, H. Let's start plotting. So negative 1, negative 1, right there, point B. Negative 3 up by 3, 1, 2, 3, right there. So that's point C. Negative 4 up by 2, negative 4 up by 2, that's point D. Negative 5 up by 1 and 2 thirds roughly there, that's point E. 1 up by 1 third, so that's roughly there, that's point F. 2 up by a half, so that's point, uh, what was it, G. And then 3 up by 0.6 or 3 fifths. That's point H. Now, you could actually check for intersection. So remember, this is my formula x equals x over x plus 2. And this was the formula for, for the horizontal, which is y equals 1. So I take this and I take my function and set them equal to each other and solve. So if you cross multiply, you get x equals x plus 2. If you cancel the x's, you get 0 equals 2, no solution. So what does that mean? No intersection. So that means the graph never crosses or touches the horizontal asymptote. So we've got everything we need to graph this. So the graph is going to follow the vertical there. It's going to hug the horizontal asymptote there indefinitely. This right here is going to follow along upward there. On this side, the graph is doing this. And it's coming down there. There you have it. Now, be careful. This is the graph of F. But that's not what they wanted us to graph. What they wanted us to graph is H. So, I do need to make a little change. Remember, what was the difference between the two graphs? This is the key difference. They match everywhere except at x equals negative 3. What's the difference when x is equal to negative 3? The graph of f has a dot, which we already know, right? right? At negative 3, so this was negative 3 right there. So at negative 3, we got a dot, the graph of f. But the graph of h has an open dot at x equals negative 3. So if I want to get the graph of h, which is really what I'm after, which is really what they wanted me to graph, I just need to make a simple tweak. Go to when x equals negative 3 and change the dot to an open dot. So I'm going to use my little eraser here, and I'm going to go in here, get rid of that C, 
and get rid of that the dot right there and I'm gonna make that into an open dot and I'm gonna make that big enough so it's easy to spot and now this is the graph of h of x equals x squared plus 3x over x squared plus 5x plus 6 now we're done and that's the final the final piece of the puzzle so again if you're not sure about everything we've done in this video go through it a few times go through it slowly pause and rewind uh, but again the key thing to remember is when you have a common factor you cannot just cancel these out and say equals so i couldn't cancel these two out and say that's equal to x over x plus two because the canceling alters the graph at one point and if it alters it it cannot be the same function anymore so you can say that that's equal to the same function so you have to call it some other function focus on graphing that because now it doesn't have a common factor which means you can follow the procedure and then to to revert back to the original function which is the one we're concerned with to begin with just make a simple tweak the tweak is locate the number the x value that makes the common factor zero which in this case is negative three go to the corresponding point and turn it into a, an open circle and that's it that's what you have to do again first time you learn this it's really tricky it takes a while to get grasp uh, all of this but hopefully this example going through it and a few times can help you understand it all right again thanks again for watching i hope these videos are helpful and uh, good luck and again if you do have questions and if you are in my class you can use the discussion forum to post your questions or you can email me to post to uh, ask questions thank you for your time